Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Sunrise Daily. I'm Chen Berlin. Also. It is a beautiful Friday morning from here in Lagos. I'm Kairi Okikielu. Welcome to the program. I'm Ayo Makine. Good morning. And good morning from Abuja. I'm Maupe Ogun Yusuf. Well, picking up on this uh, figures coming through, well, uh, at the moment, 499. That's the case. The latest recovered uh, reported cases of COVID-19. Well, yes, uh, crossing, still crossed that 30,000 mark. And, uh, okay, well, looking at the figures of those who have been discharged, well, we're hoping that um, it could just keep going a lot higher. I know there's been a lot of emphasis on us conducting a lot more tests just to get um, perhaps uh, more, a better picture mm. of where we are. And then some states now, the NCDC opening up uh, test centers. Uh, I think Nassau happens to be one of those states that they can now conduct their own state testing rather than take them to Abuja. So, um, yes, Lagos still has 157, the highest, followed by Edo, which has got 59. But then uh, several other states there, I remember. Uh, Cross River and Kogi have since recorded cases. So uh, keeping tabs to see how that case or how it's been handled and, and managed, that's it. Where, but something that does strike you now, um, yesterday we saw this protest in Imo State. It's got to do, it's, it's COVID related because um, some accounts, eyewitness accounts, did say there's a police officer having approached um, a cyclist. So uh, the cyclist was said to have committed the offence, according to the police. He wasn't wearing his face mask, and the police had asked him, uh, why are you not wearing a mask? Okay, well, uh, I think the man was saying that he didn't have the means, and so he didn't have any money with him. The police said, no, you, you've committed the offence as far as we're concerned, so you have to pay the 15 hour fine. So while the man appealed, the eyewitness said, look, the next thing they heard was a gunshot, and the chap was dead. That is why this protest, uh, those protesters, hit the street and what they're trying to avoid where lots of people will congregate with disregard to social distancing and put themselves at risk i don't know how that is not going to uh, you know get a very huge impact on this protest as you can imagine if someone and i mean thrives in a crowd but yes, the police have said the CP eventually released a statement saying that um, they've apprehended the person, they will go ahead and try him. But so many things really come to play here. How the police authorities are internalizing their role and how to conduct themselves, how to ensure that this question of uh, people wearing face masks is adhered to. Because, I mean, I've seen even in some other states, Lagos inclusive, where you're the only person in the car, they stop you and ask you why you're not wearing a face mask. And you feel, okay. <laughs> Much as people understand how some of these things should go, but I think a continuous messaging, um, interaction will help because um, that scenario there now, so it's, um, one wonders what becomes of because, I mean, what we've seen in several other areas is that when this kind of scenario happens, it leads to certain reforms such that the authorities can take such laws into their hands. But look, I know it's a big ask. You can't begin to talk about taking some holistic steps, but nothing wrong in taking some of those baby steps to correct that kind of scenario. But mm. as it is now, oh dear, I just wonder the impact that will have in that community, mm. having gathered that much right there. Whew. I mean, we'll be looking at the figures hopefully they won't rise. But when you have, you know, uh, that kind of gathering, you can imagine what will come out. But, you know, the COVID-19 pandemic presented us, like we said, an opportunity to hit the reset button. Yeah. And, you know, for the police also, a lot of people thought, maybe this is a time we'll hit that reset button for the police and at least, you know, get a lot of good reports. But, you know, when you look at the enforcement of interstate lockdown, for example, and you see... The, the activities of, of the police, uh, you know, across the borders, across the states, it really leaves a lot to be desired. And now we have this. There are videos showing, you know, policemen harassing people uh, for not wearing face masks. Now, it, it, is, it is understandable that you need to enforce some of these things, but then enforcement uh, has a limit when it crosses enforcement, for example, 
to what you see now in Imo states. Remember then that, you know, uh, 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 health workers at some point said they were going to go on strike because they were consistently being harassed by policemen. So I look back at this COVID-19 period, which we're still in, and, you know, I, I look at the activities of the police in Nigeria and, like I said, it leaves a lot to be desired. And now this happens. And obviously this, whatever trust had existed between the police and the people of this community has obviously been further broken. I mean, people don't just come out like this because we as someone has died and, and it means a lot. But obviously this tells a lot about things that have happened in the past. Maybe they think that, you know what, this is not working for us. This is one too many. And once again, I will say the police should be careful, really, should be watchful the way they handle these <coughs> issues because this is one too many. I look forward to Nigerian police, honestly, that uh, we have just little pockets of issues, not issues that you can look back. I mean, just do a search and you find plethora of stories chronicling, you know, uh, extrajudicial killings uh, and what have you. It is one too many, I see. And, 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 I, and I really hope that this will be followed through such that we don't have further issues yeah. uh, across the country. But I'd assume that the police is doing the best they can to make sure these things, you know, do not happen. Because you remember that time when we engaged the commissioner of police in Lagos about a similar matter in certain pockets of communities. And he told us they were doing what, I think what he called persuasive enforcement. In other words, that was not violent. Uh, that's what he said at the time. Persuasive enforcement, non-violence, no use of any weapon whatsoever. And we felt, okay, that's uh, you know, a good start, you know, a good thing to hear. But that's not the kind of thing you see when you, you know, get reports like this. Uh, just recently also at a bank, I think it was in Lagos or somewhere outside Lagos, I'm not sure now, where somebody wanted to get into a bank and the person, you know, was shot at for one reason or another by uh, one of the uh, policemen right there at that uh, place, how far that has gone. Of course, naturally, that also caused some rancor in that place. And to underscore what Chamberlain said, how do we ensure we're trying, we're on the one hand, we are fighting a war with an enemy that we have to look at through a microscope. Uh, that's on the one hand. Now, to now begin to contend with ourselves, you know, in this case, that's another thing entirely. And sometimes, and we have raised this issue as well, many of these policemen themselves are not wearing any form of protective masks. I, I've, we have talked about this several times on this program, asking why are they themselves not protected? You know, how well that hopefully has been resolved largely because it is, it's one hand to, it's one thing to have the mask, it's another thing to wear the mask appropriately. It hasn't been fully resolved though. It was still a case yesterday, which I saw myself. Okay, so these things keep going on and on, and the question then remains, how far are we going to have to go about this? I would also expect that the police has a daily review of activities, of the things that they do. Does that happen at the, at the local levels? <laughs> you know, part of what we're also thinking is that, look, the, the state government, I think they also need to have a meeting. Because which, number mm. one is that, were they supposed to pay this fine to the police? Mm. Why was he the one demanding for that money to be paid to him. That's, the, the penalty that, is. that's part of the extortion thing that we have been talking about, which also raises the question, you, you talked about the police, and the first thing that came to my mind when Kaude was talking was, wait a minute, we've been talking about Amotekun and all this local community policing thing all the while. Isn't this a good time to test whether or not they are effective? Where? On the streets? Communities. This is a community. What we just saw is a community. So where are well, the police, the, the enforcement agencies or agents? Is not and they, I'm, I'm, I'm just talking, look, it is a <laughs> war we are fighting. And if we can bring all our arsenal together out now, community policing was a, a strategy that the federal government spoke about and the, I, the IGP has pronounced so many times. Is this part of the community policing thing or is this just one of those challenges that we have to contend with? So long as lives are concerned, it is definitely something that gives us a lot of restlessness. Don't, don't, uh, restlessness. don't forget that as, at, as, we, as it stands, contrary to what's happening globally, we are less than 50%, we have less than 50% of recoveries or outcomes in Nigeria from this COVID-19 as opposed to what's happening in other parts in the, you know, globally. This is a concern. And I want to believe that everyone is doing everything necessary to ensure we nip this in the bud. Okay. Hey.
<clears throat> nip is in the bud. It's, it's already a full-grown plant. I, I don't know about nipping it in the bud. Um, I, I mean, if you're talking about COVID-19 or you're talking about the injustices uh, that Nigerians have faced in the hands of their own police. Uh, don't forget that this is not uh, peculiar to Nigeria. By that, I mean, uh, you know, cases of injustice uh, that brings out the anger in the people to say, no, we don't even care about our lives. We put our lives at risk uh, to protest this injustice, to bring it to light. Uh, look at what happened with the protest uh, against the murder of uh, Judge Floyd in the United States, where he was killed by the police, at, at least ostensibly that's what we saw uh, on captured on cameras when uh, you know a policeman knelt on his neck for eight, uh, eight minutes, 49 seconds. It, it was just, you know, harrowing to watch. And then you saw the response of the people there who came out in mass to say no. <laughs> yes, we're supposed to be on lockdown, but no, there are some things that we just would not tolerate. They put their lives at risk and came out in mass. You know, there were protests everywhere in, in the whole of the United States. So I know that when people see a situation of injustice, they would not care. I mean, they would stand against bullets. They would stand against anything, uh, not now talk of an enemy that they're not even seeing right now, to come and say, no, we will not stand for this. This this is unacceptable. This has no place in our society. And I think that, you know, the, the response of the police and also of government has to be that we are with you on this one. And this is not what we ask the police to do. I have always advocated that looking at the way uh, COVID-19 was spreading, that we cannot just leave it to the people, especially now that we have spoken and spoken, and it would seem that a number of people still do not believe that this disease exists or that they do, but they're like a desicle about it, you know, that we cannot just leave, uh, you know, enforcement in, in their own hands. We can't leave them to just say, you know, wear your mask at your convenience or, you know, go about it if you go about wearing without your mask if you do not want to, because you could pose a danger to other people. And as such, we've said, okay, yes, perhaps there should be some enforcement. However, this is not the sort of enforcement that we envisage. I, I remember that when I said that, one of the questions that popped up was, who will enforce it? Is it the Nigeria police? And there were big questions around that, because as Kaede already pointed out, you know, we saw what happened with enforcement of uh, state lockdown and, and how porous our borders were, our state borders were, uh, when it came to entrusting it to the care of the police. And this was one of the dangers we, you know, we we, we thought could, could come out of it if the police was left to enforce things like face masks. Don't forget that there was also an incident, I think, was it in Anambra or so, uh, where a man's life was put in danger because uh, the police was asking him to wear his mask. It, it was a very, very, uh, you know, a very disturbing situation. So I, I think that right now there needs to be a strong statement made by the Nigeria police that this is not us. This is not, this man was acting on his own. He was, yes, he was wearing our uniform and he was supposed to be acting with the authority of the Nigeria police, but this was not what we instructed anyone to do. Uh, this put li puts lives in danger. Uh, in danger. This, uh, you know, breaks down the trust which you are trying to build with communities. This is not who we are. And that when we see a situation like this, we will put our foot firmly down uh, to, to say this, <laughs> this is not a representation of the Nigerian police. So this is not the police that we desire, the police that we're working towards. The state government also needs to find new ways to ensure that communi the communities, I mean, Kaede, I beg your pardon, I, I'm just with you on this one, uh, to find ways that the community themselves own the project of enforcement, uh, that they themselves see the need uh, for them to abide by the rules. A mask is not such a difficult thing to make. It's not, it shouldn't be one that you buy. It could be one that you make in your house. It could be a handkerchief you put over your nose. Uh, people just say, wear a covering. So I think that if communities understand this and they understand that it is for their own good and for the protection of their own communities, they will find ways to be able to ensure that they enforce this. And where it is extremely difficult, then maybe we can enlist the help of the police. But we must always stress that it has to be without force. Uh, it has to be without, you know, use of force. I, I do not know why, you know, force has to be involved, if not that, you know, there could be some underlying request which wasn't met. And at the end of the day, somebody resorted to his or her gun just to make a point known. And, you know, it has resulted in the death of someone. It is a very sad situation, very heartbreaking to see. But it's one that we must all stand against and say, no, this is not what we are asking for. And this is totally unacceptable in our society. And we will require and demand justice and we will not rest until justice is meted out. Gentlemen. Yeah, so all eyes will be on that. So unfortunately, you can't get that life back. So, well, let's take a moment and then we'll come back to you with the dailies.
Come on, let's take you through some of the dailies. Look at Vanguard, day four. Panel, grills, magus, seven untouchables. That's a big lead on the front page of Vanguard newspaper today. Seven untouchables accused of blackmail, extortion of money from suspects, appropriating exhibits, selling off forfeited slash seized assets. Asked to explain role in exploits of an acting AFCC chairman, Magu brought to Aso Villa at about 10 yesterday for more grilling. So that is still hugging the headlines, the big one here, as a matter of fact, on the front page of Vanguard today. So that is what you see right there. But right above that, uh, COVID-19, NDDC taken to task by Senate over 3.14 billion naira palliative for police and then staff. Yeah. So that's what you find. And then uh, the regulation, FG never promised to keep fuel price permanently low. As I described to the minister, but let's flip flop and fluctuations. I don't know, just might get to a limit where people feel they just had enough of it. You never know. Look at the back page of Vanguard's post there. Musa's biggest Eagles player for now, says Baba Yaro. Uh, Chukweze Villarreal keep Europe dream alive with Getafe win. Uh, Rivers Angels debunk Oluehi Mwabuku transfers. So they've got several others on the back page, but that's Vanguard this morning. We'll take a look at the Guardian newspaper. More operators quit $17 billion e-commerce sector. That's here in Nigeria, by the way. You see riders, how poor logistics, infrastructure, distrust hinder players. Fake product, bad customer service, worry consumers. Ghana beats Nigeria on global average spending. But you know, when you look at $17 billion, so yes, there is that money in court. So obviously, that money is going somewhere, right? So if we have a, a little, about 10 operators exiting in just a decade, and you still call it the $17 billion e-commerce sector, you wonder where all that money is going to. But you know what, right at the big picture that shows the vice president presiding over a virtual National Economic Council meeting in Abuja yesterday, you see ASU films as U.S. plans to deport 16,000 Nigerian students. You recall that all back and forth about when, when your school switches to, you know, online that you might have to leave uh, the United States. And, you know, you see the writer knocks federal government over a neglect of education system, says years of agitation for improved sector vindicated that story starts on the front page continues on page six and there's this one quite interesting one fg gets ultimatum to reverse indefinite closure of schools just to get this right some people are telling the federal government that in seven days you have to reverse that decision and allow schools reopen pretty much but you find more details on page three wondering who's saying that from where it is coming well page three of the Vanguard newspaper this morning. And this one, Nigeria develops COVID-19 test kit. Outcome of Madagascan organics out soon. It's been months, actually. Been expecting that one. But you see uh, page three of the Guardian newspaper this morning. Uh, a couple of other stories. INEC declares no face mask, no voting in Ondo, Edo, Gubai elections. We'll see how that will be enforced. I mean, because we just talked about that earlier on. And you see more details on page seven of the Guardian this morning. Let's leave it there for The Guardian. The Daily Trust newspaper leads with panel orders EFCC directors to account for five-year role. Stories on page three. Find out the details on the inside pages. And right under that one, uh, you see that right under that picture of uh, police parading some gang, Senate NDDC spa over 3.14 billion naira palliatives to staff and police find out the details, the story is on page 5. Our agency hijacked by legislators for self-help. Fruitless probe by National Assembly, not helpful. That's according to CSOs. Find out what that is all about. Right under the nameplate, we can't bear petrol subsidy anymore, says the federal government. Uh, the story is on page 5. And right under the, on the, by the bottom of the page, Clergyman blames devil for impregnating daughter. Oh my God, have to imprison this devil. 
On page 19, local vehicle plants achieved 3% capacity in six years. Uh, that story is on page 19. COVID-19, FG launches kit to test 5 million farmers. Find that on page 12 of the Daily Trust newspaper this morning. Okay. Okay, let's quickly look at Leadership Friday for you here looking at this. COVID-19 breakthrough as Nigeria creates own testing kits. Uh, that's the lead story on the front page of Leadership Friday. 400 health workers, FCT Health Secretary, Nasarawa, I don't know if that's Attorney General, but it says AG, uh, test positive. NEC, PTF to meet on reopening of schools, others, you also see the WAHO, that's W-A-H-O. I don't know what that abbreviation stands for. But it says, urges Nigeria, others to mitigate impact of pandemic on the vulnerable. Johesu donates PPEs to members on frontline duties. Popular CNN anchor Richard Quest relieves coronavirus experience. Yeah, I remember reading his experience. He it says it's like a tornado you know, whirling through your body, you know. Anyways, I want to read details on page four of the paper. Looking at other stories there, Oshibajo writes IGP wants alleged link to Magu funds, in parenthesis there, investigated as panel grills EFCC secretary directors. Operatives in search my house, as according to Abdul Salami. I don't know who that is, but you might want to see details on page uh, four of the paper as well. Look at the story here. $9.6 billion debt. How PNID bribed Nigerian officials, lawyers tell U.S. court. And if you look at the bottom, there are a number of stories, but I'm going to highlight this one, uh, or two of them here. Stamp duty, 15,000 jobs at risk as nine post workers threaten strike. I think that will make quite an interesting read. Outrage as Lebanese ambassador walks out on NAS members. Okay, how did that happen? Where did that happen? You know, just what brought about that happening? You might want to read details uh, somewhere inside the paper. Let's leave it there for Leadership Friday. I'll take a look at the Nigerian Tribune next. Uh, they also focus on the EFCC, but it says EFCC secretary directors appear before pro panel. Oshimbajo writes IGP wants allegation linking him to four billion naira probed. Magu spends fourth day before Justice Salami panel. Abdul Salami says, house not searched by EFCC. So all of those stories associated with that, you can get right there, right now, if you want. Well, look at this down at the bottom. How NDDC spent 81 billion naira in eight months. 3.14 billion naira spent on COVID-19. 475 million are shared to police for PPEs. So they've got a different version of that one. That's what you get to find right there. So they've got several other stories, including that of Nipos. But that is um, Tribune this morning. Well, if you take a look at the Daily Times this morning, they put that NDDC story in a different light. It says, Senate NDDC fight over cash. And when you picture that, what comes to mind? You know, but that's how the Daily Times puts it this morning. You know, that will pick your interest and you wonder what happened. Page two of the Daily Times. And, you know, right under the big picture, you see Naptip arrests 116 human traffickers, rescues 1,489 victims. So human trafficking is still a big deal. And, you know, not to forget that editorial that says, let schools remain closed. So that might be an interesting read for the Daily Times this morning. Uh, that ends a look at some of the dailies here today. We're back in a moment. Stay with us. Welcome back. It appears the probe uh, becoming extensive if the directors and secretaries and some of the officials are reported to appear before that panel. So who knows what next? Well, Mr. Paul Ananaba, Senior Advocate of Nigeria, joins us now to weigh in into this. Good morning and thank you for joining us today. Well, so much, there's a lot of uh, hazy scenarios uh, about what is playing out, who is where. Well, speaking about processes and um, who should be occupying certain positions, there are many who just uh, have certain perspectives, but who knows what it is, but what's come, what comes to you in terms of 
how this process is playing itself out now about the presidential panel probing now not just the EFCC chairman, acting chairman now, if he still is, and now members of the EFCC, officials of EFCC, appearing before the panel. Yeah, good morning, uh, Nigerians. I, um, yes, you say it's, it's a bit hazy because not much information has been given out. I would have preferred a situation where we have at least uh, the basic information, but I think what we know is that uh, there's a presidential panel. Um, investigation is going on and all that. It's, it's part of what um, uh, has been complained about by several Nigerians. Information is important. It is uh, with uh, official information that you can do a thorough analysis. It looks as if um, you have to check here and there from rumor mills and all that, uh, social media, before you will be able to even have some idea of what's going on. But what we see is that uh, the uh, former acting uh, chairman of the EFCC uh, is before a panel and there's a catalog of um, uh, allegations against him. And possibly we don't know the extent of invitation presently, but what you also know is what you have just said that other people have been invited. Because when you do investigation, uh, even if it is one person, it could lead to uh, corroboration and trying to find out whether what the person being investigated is saying is correct or not. So that may be what it is. But um, because we now know at least that the panel is headed by Justice Salami. Uh, we have some degree of confidence that um, justice will be done because Justice Chancellor has um, a pedigree of, uh, you know, high reputation uh, to many of us. So we believe that uh, under his watch, he will give a um, fair um, hearing and Mr. Anaba, you know, observe the rule of When you now but speak of... Let me just jump in before you, perhaps you could also respond to it in addition to your thoughts or your points which you are going to make now. When you say justice be done, predicated on what? Is this panel, which law are we going to refer to? Do they have that power to see that justice is done other than making a recommendation? Isn't it going to go before the court of law for him no, to have... No, so, this, the process. This is a panel headed by a former... Uh, president of the Court of Appeal. It's not um, just an A panel. And it means that um, that's what we're saying. We do not have all the information. We can only uh, uh, discuss what we know. Uh, having been he headed by the president of the former president of the Court of Appeal, it means the government takes this investigation very seriously. Um, it's an investigation. It's not a trial, it's investigation. But the worry and concern we have is that when the former chairman was chairman of EFCC, did he even also give people pay hearing? There were so much complaints. I don't know whether uh, you had uh, any issue of going to the EFCC during this time. You know, so, um, but it's important that every Nigerian, whether he gave fair hearing and um, due process a chance. You could you were you you were aware that many times even when the courts um grant people bail and even the conditions that EFCC gives to people in in, in terms of bail when the court has said a, a burdensome bail condition is it amounts to no bail at all. So when you have such condition conditions today he didn't know it will be investigated in this manner. So we need to begin to build better institutions and not building better, uh, very strong people. So today, uh, uh, Mr. Margo is now going through investigation. So uh, when I say uh, fair hearing or uh, due process, it is that this is a special judicial process. 
So since it is a process where the rights of a person is being looked into, that may lead to his losing his fundamental rights at an imprisonment or conviction, then um, there's a requirement of fair hearing. There's a requirement of due process. And that is what we are saying. Today, we can see the ephemerality of power so that it is a lesson for Nigerians and even globally. Whatever position you occupy, do things properly. Just maybe, just maybe we'll touch on that, that ground. Uh, just maybe we'll touch on the issues you raised about you know, what you perceive as you know, the way he handled the office and EFCC during his time, I mean, the way and manner in which, you know, these cases were handled. Just maybe we'll touch on, on that grouse. But, you know, when you say that, I mean, there should be fair hearing and, you know, we don't exactly know what the outcome will be, it seems you have an inkling because you, you have referred to him, uh, like, over two times now as a former acting chairman of the EFCC. So it appears as though an outcome has come out already. Well, I, it's, it's because I, you read in the papers that... Um, um, somebody's acting now. Of course, the government cannot leave EFCC without an acting head. So there, could, there wouldn't be two acting heads at the time. So like I said, there is scanty information. If I say the acting uh, chairman of EFCC, uh, I don't know where I could base that because he is in the, he has been with the panel for some days now, and um, more people have been called in. So, and, um, it's been well, said where, that where do we then base the activities of this <laughs> panel? For instance, when you say, yes, it's headed by a former president of the Court of Appeal, he is going to ensure justice is being done. So what do we rely on? What laws do we rely on? What are the guidelines for a panel? such as this one, if, uh, I mean, for president's sake, who knows if there's one tomorrow, what is the requirement? Do we know if they, are they supposed to obtain a court order to hold him or not allow him to go home for three, four days? Oh, what that, are the that, processes? That's, 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 um, that's another level of discussion. Now, um, there is also no clear, um, official statement whether he's been detained or not. The Constitution talks about detention. The Constitution does not envisage um, when the public officer is with the, the presidency. Uh, we don't know where he is, or you just hear, you just get information, bits of information on the social media or, and all that, and the channel, uh, Television station. So it's important to have comprehensive information, but my analysis is based on what can be pieced together. Now, uh, what, there were official statements from DSS and EFCC that there was no arrest, and then, and that there were, obviously there was no detention. But he's been with the panel for this day, number of days. Now, with Nigeria does not lack laws. For, um, in our criminal jurisprudence and criminal justice system. Um, this is not a trial where you will be talking about whether it's a court or jurisdiction and all that. This is just an investigation. And in, just like in channels, if there's an, if there's an allegation against the staff, they could set up a panel to, to hear uh, what has been said and then give hearing, you know, to the, to the accused person. So that is what the issue, my understanding of what the issue is. So um, I have not heard that uh, Mr. Magu is challenging his detention or that he is complaining of being detained or that he's challenging any process. So to that extent, I'm not going to speculate. But I'm going to say that um, Whatever that is being done should comply with due process. If he was actually detained, um, I want to know whether the panel has powers to detain. I want to know whether um, they obtain an order from even a magistrate court for detention. 
This is a due process. But like we said, you cannot now make the British statements because there are little information that's been given out officially. The theme, obviously, is the fact that there is little or no information, the scarcity of official information as to what is happening, how it is happening, who has been questioned, what is the way forward, who is the administrative head uh, of the EFCC. I, I, and one wonders, what is the thinking behind that? Is it that putting out that information will jeopardize this process or maybe something else is happening? What might be the thinking behind this? I mean, you know, as a lawyer, we understand you know, some of these issues, you deal with them on a daily. So what do you think is the thinking behind this? Well, um, not long ago, there was a jurisprudence that emerged in Nigeria, the jurisprudence of um, national security, where you begin to hear that once national security is involved, that uh, fundamental rights take a back seat. I do not know whether that is the position, whether there are national security issues considering the status of Mr. Mago. But we, as legal practitioners, we, we do not support the idea of uh, national security putting some fundamental rights behind because it is fundamental rights and rule of law, due process, that identifies what is national security. So whatever is uh, behind uh, what this type of procedure, uh, I don't endorse it because um, today is, my, is Mr. Magu. Tomorrow, it could be another person. So fundamental rights should be observed. Rule of law should be followed. Due process should be followed for everybody. And I think the Magu case will help in developing our jurisprudence now that people will now begin to know that, oh, it, everyone should be entitled to this these basic principles that make us human beings. The state does not give you fundamental right. It is given by God. That is the essence of your living as a human being. People should be fair to each other. So that even when any security agency invites people or arrests people, they should know that such person that has been arrested is entitled to fundamental rights and is entitled to due process. And media trial, uh, sensational news and all that should be avoided so that we, we, we before uh, the person is even tried, you don't begin to hear that the person is a criminal already. That's what our constitution says, presumption of innocence. Even as we speak, until found guilty, uh, Mr. Mago is presumed innocent. So he should be accorded the basic rights. But in his time, did he do that? I doubt. So those who are occupying whatever position and those who will occupy such positions tomorrow, whatever position you are, remember that the next person is a human being. You should be given fundamental rights and due process and then the rule of law should be applied in whatever that is being done. Well, it's a very long uh, conversation about the, you know, the process from the beginning of the entire process up until this moment, uh, the issues of uh, process, procedures, and fundamental rights, crucial one that you just mentioned is there. Because I'm also wondering if after all of this, you know, hypothetically speaking, Mr. Magu is clear. Does he have a right to go to court and say that his, his fundamental rights were, were stepped upon? But then that's a, a matter for some other future day to come. But looking at the, the, the substance of the matter, which is the fact that uh, Mr. Magu is supposed to be the lead, uh, the, 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 the chief of the lead agency uh, fighting corruption in Nigeria, and you would recall that the entire process of his uh, uh, confirmation and all of that up until this moment is merged in a lot of um, disagreement with the National Assembly until um, the Eighth Assembly um, ended its work. Uh, do you think that in any way smears the corruption fight of governments, you know, putting in such a person into office who was not confirmed by the National Assembly and now is being tried or rather probed by the same presidency? Again, 
I I go back to the points I was making. Now, the point I was making is that we should um, uh, uh, we should continue to follow due process in what we do. At a time, why will uh, we allow uh, Mr. Mago to act for more than five years? Now, why will you allow Mago to act for five years as, as in an acting capacity? Is that is that the only is he the only Nigerian that is capable of doing this work? If the National Assembly has said no twice, then you you then you move on. There are many many Nigerians who could do it, and you you will imagine that um, uh, the the. The, the rejection of Mr. Magu was based on DSS report, and I want to I want to um, endorse the the, the 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 DSS for being frank and open. That there was no compromise in their report, which many people would have would have uh, would have looked at and wanted, and you see. Yeah. So some of the issues raised here, I hope you can hear me. Some of the issues, does this, isn't this an opportunity for a revision or revisiting the operations, the laws guiding operations of the commission? If you look at some of the allegations that they say uh, that he's answering to, setting off certain seas, assets, and those kind of scenarios, do you think that this affords us an opportunity to ensure that Whoever becomes the next chairman of the commission doesn't wield such powers as is reported in this case. The powers of the EFCC chairman are defined in the EFCC Act. However, you will, we will, if you had followed my analysis, you will find out that the, the past EFCC chairman had become even bigger than the, than the EFCC itself. We must build good institutions and not individuals. Now, what point it is is that if we had, if it was an institution, then whether it is Magu or no Magu, and there, the institution will still run properly. Now, it means that we should no longer assume and leave too much powers in the hands of the EFCC chairman. There should now be some a rethinking and revisiting. In fact, an outright amendment of the EFCC Act. If you recall, at some point, the EFCC Act was amended at about 2006 or thereabout. Because the EFCC, even when it came up, uh, had issues with whether it could run along with the Police Act, the Constitution, and then the PA, ICPC Act. They, they, there is so much um, convergence in the process. EFCC is about economic crimes. ICPC is about corruption. But that is another discussion for another day. So it's a time to review the um, anti-crime, anti-corruption agencies of government, streamline them, and, and have specialization. Now you also have NFIE. So, so that we can uh, have some degree of sanity and um, specializations and effectiveness. Do you think you that? Tied to one person, you do you think these cases? Do you think these cases would have come up if, for instance, the the AGF didn't raise them? Well, the Attorney General, uh, according to clear Supreme Court decisions. Is um, is more or less a god unto himself in uh, in um, in terms of um, uh, legal process in a country. So if the attorney general raises an, a, 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 a a memo as we we we, we are told, uh, which is also part of what we are saying, these things should have should have come officially for Nigerians to know for Nigerians to know. But assuming that that was true. If the Attorney General raises 
uh, an objection or a query or a, a, a you know a memo in the manner that we have uh, the, the Attorney General raised, it cannot be treated with levity because he's the chief law officer of the state of the country. So you cannot equate a petition by any group to uh, an advice or a memo by the Attorney General. So well, the, the, that memo uh, would have weighed heavily. You know what it could take to uh, actually interrogate the EFCC chairman. Well, we need, we need to wind down now. So tell us in conclusion, <laughs> Mr. Nanaba, in the event yes. that the panel says there are questions to answer in their recommendation, what should be the natural next step to take according to law? Well, the, the, the Attorney General has all the powers. He has all the powers to uh, prosecute even Magu. The only, the only remedy against the Attorney General is for the um, is for the appointor, the president, to remove him. Again, he raises the question of why, whether we should continue to have the Attorney General of the Federation and the Minister of Justice together as one office. So uh, that I has guess been discussed several. <laughs> That will be it's, another it's major so major point in the days so ahead. So All right, so we do. Okay, we, we thank you for your thoughts this morning, Mr. Paul Ananaba, Senior Advocate of Nigeria. Well, we will be back in a moment. Uh, stay with us. As you know, that the Nigerian economy has been facing significant challenges, at least in the first half of the year. The macroeconomic environment has been really challenged and disrupted. Crude oil prices have declined, and uh, we have had to adjust our budgets and our medium-term plans as a result. And also, another development that has affected us is the massive cuts that OPEC has now uh, imposed on OPEC members and OPEC allies to our production, crude oil production volume. So our crude oil production uh, level uh, provided by OPEC is now 1.4 million barrels per day with 30,000 um, uh, million barrels per day as condensing, so a total of 1.7 million barrels per day. We uh, also discussed with uh, NEC the gross revenue that we're expecting from the uh, into the Federation account, which will subsequently be shared. The revised 2020 budget is has a total expenditure of 9.116 trillion, while the projection we're making for 2021 budget is at, uh, right now at 9.613 trillion. So after the consultations with NEC and with National Assembly and with the public, We'll now make any adjustments that become necessary before we go eventually go to the Federal Executive Council for approval. Our target is to continue with the momentum that has started to ensure that we meet the January to December the, the December budget deadline. And to be able to do the uh, meet the deadline for the budget, we have to get the MTF done and approved because it forms the framework for the budget. Oh, yeah, so clearly challenges ahead, and we just need to, that means we'll brace ourselves, not tighten our belt, <laughs> as they will normally say. Well, Vincent Wani, uh, Dr. Vincent Wani joins us next. He's a business and investment consultant. Good morning, and thank you for joining us today. Well, the president is uh, going to sign, as reported, the, ten, the revised 10.8 trillion era budget, which was passed by the National Assembly in June today. So, um, all of those challenges. Uh, what needs to be done. Uh, from your perspective, how do you see all of these things eventually uh, playing out and then impacting on Nigerians? Thank you, Chamberlain, and good morning again. Uh, yes, the president is going to sign the revised 2020 budget today. It was passed by the House, I think, 10th of June, passed by the Senate, 11th of June. Uh, today is 10th of July. 
That's one month after it was passed. From 2000 and uh, from um, 1999 to 2019, it took our president, not just this one, average of 19 days from the day the budget uh, is finally passed by the National Assembly to sign it. And this is taking a little bit more, one, one, one month. You know, so I'm looking at it one from the timeline. You know, if this budget was meant to address uh, COVID-19 crisis and oil price crisis, you know, I was thinking that it should come a little bit quicker. You know, since March, we've had COVID-19 in Nigeria. This is July, four months lost. And we're talking about budget. And all the things we've been doing about this budget is how to move it from spending so much time moving something from 55 or 56 dollars per barrel to 35 it is today. I think we've wasted so much time on doing the, the smallest thing for ourselves as a country and for our people. You know, we've seen countries that even passed bigger budget in two weeks and also signed into law. The next day it was signed, uh, it passed uh, into law. You know, we're talking about just about 20 billion US dollar budget here. And substantial part of it are even going to come from borrowing. We've not spent so much time in looking at how the alternative income will come, apart from oil, because oil is in crisis and will continue to be in crisis. Even without COVID-19, oil industry would have also been in crisis for one reason or the other, the shale gas and the whole lot of uh, innovations coming into that space. You know, so, but again, um, it's, ne it's better late than never. We want to congratulate our Nigerians, congratulate the uh, president for signing for uh, signing this budget today. Um, but again, this is the time to now go to the field to make sure that this budget actually fulfill the objective. And the objective is to stabilize this economy in this pandemic crisis time to ensure that Nigeria doesn't dip into, doesn't fall into very deep recession as predicted by so many local and international um, analysts and organizations, including the um, World Bank and IMF. You know, 10.8 trillion naira. You know, what type of palliative are we now going to see finally this budget is passed to flow into critical sector and also to flow into the poorest of the poor? You know, I've taken a look at the um, the palliative that was uh, uh, passed, uh, uh, palliative measures, you know, both the physical side and the monetary side. You know, and I said, this is fine, but again, it's still a drop of water in a very big ocean. You know, we have increased the um, social register from something like 2.6 million people to 3.6 million. Hey, we have, this register doesn't even cover 87% of very poor Nigerians. It doesn't cover um, poorest of the poor. It doesn't cover the uh, informal economy that contributes over 50% to GDP. So how much is this budget and how much is the COVID-19 palliative um, measures? going to address the fear of recession that we're facing uh, remain to be seen. And but like I said before, <clears throat> it's better late than never, but it's actually, if, because timeline is very, very key. If you could add to that, now that, uh, well, they're talking about uh, making up for lost time with the unification of the budget cycle, the January, December cycle, which is part of what they also want to address, the directive that they say they've got from the president. But in the days ahead, Yes, there will be challenges. Look, companies here have been hit. We know they've spoken about the aviation industry, how much they lose on a daily basis. Do you think we have properly looked into this and saying, look, these are, I mean, even the agri sector too is equally going to experience that challenge. How prepared do you think we are from these documents that you've seen? Uh, Chamberlain, um, we've seen the documents. You know, I've said it before that the, it's a little drop of water in a big bucket. And let me not use ocean, you know, in a big bucket. You know, the impact, the, the size is rather too small. We're talking about an economy that is over 400 billion um, US dollar economy, that's GDP. You know, we're talking about population of over 200 million people. And here we're talking about budget of 28, 29 billion US dollars. And we're going to borrow substantially to even fund the, this budget. You know, we're talking about current GDP at 1.8%. Um, 
this if you if you try to add all of this number and look at the palliative and not even look at again the capital expenditure the revenue expenditure mix of that budget you know and, and everything you find out that it's not different from what we used to have over the last five ten years it's still the normal budget what change is the is the team of the budget what change is just the um is what change is the mantra of the budget in terms of the budget line by line the budget component, um, uh, recurrent expenditure, uh, capital expenditure, source of financing the budget, we're still in the same part. Nothing has changed. You know, 50, 50 billion US dollars, um, sorry, 50 billion naira yama by CBN to flow into the SME. We have said over 70 million SMEs in Nigeria. What can 50 million do to them? How many of them have assessed it? These are, the, these are the things we begin to ask. Some other physical measures, are they being implemented? You know, we're told that um, importers or whatever of critical uh, um, raw materials, we're will, 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 will going to give them moratorium so that they, so, so, such that uh, the demorage they've accumulated is not going to impact on their, on their cost of, um, on their uh, cost of production. But that is not happening. You know, it's interesting. Import we're going back to that debate about, uh, you know, whether or not our budget should be bigger. I'm not sure if, if that's where you're going, because from all indications, the, the 2021 budget will be lesser than this, apparently, maybe about 9 trillion naira compared to this 10.8 trillion naira. But obviously, this is where we are right now. We have responsibilities. We have to service our debts, for example. We have those recurrent that we have to sort out. I mean, so we don't look like bad debtors and, uh, and what have you. So these are the challenges we have. And, and a lot of you know, suggestions about how we'll move. There's an impending recession. Are we meant to spend our way uh, out of this recession or invest in infrastructure out of this recession? For the months remaining in this year, what do you think should be our approach? We have this document. How should our approach be? Uh, my approach, uh, our approach should be less on spending so much time on talking about that $5 per bar. $50 per barrel. You know, I've seen the MTEP for 2020, 2021 to 2023. You know, and the assumption, you know, we've already projected our year price will be $40 in 2022, 2023. How do we know? January 1 this year, if we're told that our year price will come down to close to $20. You know, so these are the things we don't know. And spending so much time on OEL, only year fortune have clearly disappointed us. So this is the time to begin to spend so much time on how to generate other sources of revenue um, from other sources other than oil. You know, IMF, World Bank, and even local analysts have said that the challenge of Nigeria is how to generate money, how to generate foreign um, uh, forex other than oil. That is a major problem. You know, and that is why our budget side is small. We're spending uh, uh, about 50% of our total revenue to service debt. You know, we need to begin to look at how to incentivize private sector, whether they are in Nigeria or whether they are elsewhere, on how to bring in their money to critical sectors of the Nigerian economy. The ELGP, you know, um, developed and approved in 2017, said that private sector have to fund that policy up to 75%. We're looking for private sector investment of almost up to 280 billion US dollars. How many came since then? What, what is our FDI year to date? We're competing with Ghana. Ghana. Ghana, whose population is just competing with Lagos population. So it is about reform. It's about confidence. And I'm saying that waiting three months or four months into the pandemic for us to come up with a revised budget is not the best way of giving confidence to public private sector that would have bring in their money. Okay. Critical reforms. Okay, yeah. let me ask you. Without the uh, hard reforms we did in telecoms and IT um, uh, uh, so many years ago, what would be of financial system now? The telecom industry is now the fastest growing uh, 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 industrial sector in Nigeria and the second biggest sector from one of the least sector about 15 okay. years ago. These are what okay. reforms can do. So it's reforms all the way, giving confidence to private sector. Now, Mr. Awani, so what kind of reform would you expect um, that will, as you said, incentivize the private sector strong enough 
in a way that it will really make meaning, significant meaning to those who are on the lower rung of the economy, the micro, small and medium enterprises. I say that because as you very well know, if the private sector is not fully uh, engaged in this process, there is no way that we can have a significant jump in economic activities in the country. So how do you think we can make that transition so that governments, the private sector, the organized private sector, both of them can you know, work strongly enough in a way that it will trickle down to the micro, small and medium enterprises, which form a significant chunk of the economy. Thank you very much. For a long time, and probably since my adult life, I don't know before, Nigeria have always been on the path or on the verge of economic miracle. Clearly, the policymakers understand and know exactly what to do. What is missing are political will, ethnic will, and religious will. We must marry these three key wills in Nigeria to make progress. So we know what to do. Who says we don't know what to do? Our leaders, their children are schooling abroad because they know that Nigerian educational system is, is broken down. Is broken. They treat themselves and their families abroad because they know that health systems here and health system is not working here. So if you, they, they know what to do, we all know what to do. You know, we all have generators in our house because we know that power is critical. So having said that, we need to address this political will to do the right thing. We've seen countries in the US over two trillion, and the substantial part of it goes straight into the people uh, into the hands of people. Not just working people working in the formal sector, but people working in the informal sector. But here we don't have data to implement such, even if we have the money. You know, 3.6 million people in our social register, compared to almost 100 million people that are below the poverty line. So recognizing Nigerians where they are and having their information is very, very key to make sure that our social intervention, you know, crystallizes and materializes. All right, so... Now, Pardon me, but we need to add this so that uh, we're able to have time to respond to it. One of the other challenges that uh, people have got to face, particularly if they need to move from where you are to the mainland, is this one. Have a look. We now want to replace all the worn out uh, bearings and the expansion joint. That one necessitates the partial closure of Third Mainland Bridge, which is coming up. Uh, on the 24th of July by uh, 12 midnight. When you are coming from Ikoyi side, that is from Island, that's the side we are going to start work on first. And that's the side we are closing. So coming to Island from Oro Soki, we'll be hoping for traffic in the morning. So traffic can use that side. After the first three months, because it's going to take about three months, we now change to the other lane. And now, if you are now coming from the island, going to Ouro-Toki, you now have to divert. Various alternatives have been made available. Uh, last month, we'll be uh, working with FRSD. Um, they have mapped out uh, the alternative, they'll be on the road to ensure that we have a smooth journey. So those going from the island to the mainland in the morning have to use alternative routes to the Cold Bridge, Carter Bridge, etc. And then when they're coming back in the evening, they use the Cold Bridge, Carter Bridge, etc. So Mr. Wani, how are you preparing for this in 14 days? <laughs> well, we were all together when uh, the Tunnel Land Bridge was repaired, um, I think 2008, yes, 2008, I can remember that year vividly. It always comes with its own pain, you know, no matter the, yes, the alternative routes, you know, they're still going to be pain. Because Tunnel Land Bridge is the busiest road in Nigeria and the busiest road in Africa. Ministry of Works came up last year to tell us that about 150, 120, 150,000 vehicles ply that uh, bridge every day. But independent analysts have even counted. I said it's all, about 500,000. The nearest, busiest road in Nigeria is the Lagos Ibadan Road. I saw, I saw one interchange that accounts for about 45 
thousand vehicular flow in a, in, a, in, in a day. And remember that this road connects Ireland to mainland and connects Nigeria and the world to the economic capital of the biggest, which is a VI lake of the biggest economy in, in the world. So in when you are closing your busy, busiest road, and when you are also um, putting some hitch in people being able to connect to your business capital, you want to look at economic benefit analysis. This repair is going to cost 56 billion. How much is the economy going to lose during these three or six months? During the six months, you need to put that into perspective. During the pandemic, all over the world, you can read about it, California, in um, um, uh, Los Angeles, busy roads were repaired. You know, roads that would have been repaired for three months, six months, were repaired in two, three weeks because there's no flow of uh, traffic on those roads. And these are some of the ways through which countries all over the world have been able to turn this crisis to some level of opportunity. We did not do that. That's a challenge. And I've also asked some people, you know, at the same time, a Koroduro is under construction, a co-bridge um, we've not uh, completed that, you know. So to me, uh, the economy is going to experience some more shock beyond the shock we just spoke about caused by COVID-19 that will lead Nigeria into some level of uh, recession if, we're, if, we, if we don't uh, do it well. So you know, by and so, large, it comes with the economic cost, loss of time, about 1.5 million Nigerians ply Todd Milan Bridge every day, and they, they waste about three hours on daily basis right now, as uh, spending, uh, they, they, which they spend in traffic. That three hours is going to be increased to like six hours, multiplied by 1.5 million or 2, uh, 2 million uh, uh, people that apply that road. So these are some of the things we need to consider. You know, considering those things, you've talked about, you know, the amount of the, the, the money which will be spent to repair, you know, the bridge. You talked about the loss uh, on the other hand. And some older, other people will say, well, when you compare the lives also, which is quite important, you can't exactly put uh, a cost to that. But obviously, there, there will be losses. Hours, you know, businesses will be at the receiving end, especially businesses on the island and even on the mainland that have to, you know, use that bridge. So in terms of palliative, because that's the buzzword, uh, for this period. It, should the government be looking at something to cushion the effect on businesses that will be at the receiving end of this? Because for three months uh, or even more, that's going to be huge. I, I think so. You know, government uh, working hard to reduce the rate at which people must come to work in the island or come to go to work in the mainland. You know, executives that live in the island um, work in the, uh, um, uh, that live in the island work in the mainland as, uh, you know, and, and people commute so much. You know, if government can invest in on internet, you know, fast speed, cheap, or even free internet to keep people more in their houses than using that road, that's the quality we want to see. You know, if we can um, do something very fast to move people from Oboroshoki, you know, through the waterways, you know, to Leki, to um, Semes area, to uh, Ikui, that's, you know, something like BRT on the water, from that Oroshoki houses. These are some palliatives we want to see beyond the go bridge and you know, to the side. We've tried those things before. We know that they are better in on paper than, uh, 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 than uh, in reality. You know, we want to see palliative that IT level of palliative and waterways level of palliative. The Korodu, uh, Badore, uh, in waterway, it's not, it's not enough. It can't solve this issue, you know. Um, so these are the things we want to see. Internet, fast internet to keep people from their uh, to, in their house more. Also, persuade corporates, you know, so that people that can work at home will work at home. All of this will reduce the traffic we want to see on the road. Reduce the hydrocarbon people are burning and everything. You know, working at home is not very popular all over the world, so we can use that. But they need infrastructure, and again, they also need light to work at home. For Christ's sake, you need to power your system. You need to have speed, reliable, and cheap internet. These are the areas government can do more than just diverting to. Um, other routes that are already busy. What about the stimulus package? I think the NEC, they, they consistently had this meeting about uh, stimulus packages that the country residents are supposed to benefit from. I understand that some states are now signing up to it. Don't you see that that will make some impact, if not huge impact? It will. It will, it will clearly. You know, the stimulus package pa packages. And, and beyond the actual impact, even the confidence, the the patriotism, such um, gesture or such initiative 
resonate among the citizens is also very, very important. You know, so we want to see more of this coming, you know, and also we want to see government that is more reform sensitive, you know, that is also more proactive than reactive and also moving Even Dr. Wani, faster. Um, this informal sector that we refer to all the time, huge informal sector, yeah, we can't particularly measure it. So how much resilience do you think they have? I mean, can it actually cushion the impact that the economy will take? Studies uh, over time um, confirm that the informal sector is a bedrock or is the bedrock of the Nigerian economy. You know, shocks after, after shocks that we have experienced, both during the global financial crisis of 2008 uh, to 2010, you know, the uh, recession we had in 2006, 2007, you know, and the slow growth we've had since then. It is the informal sector that are really captured or calculated that continue to uh, make us not to sink deep, that, uh, uh, deeper, you know. And studies have shown that a lot of things are happening in that uh, in that uh, sector. You know, in one of those studies, they say, can you imagine if we have a steady power supply, what this sector would have done for the country? You know, can, can you imagine if we have those policies that help this informal sector to formalize their businesses instead of formal sector? Drifting into small scale, uh, micro scale, and finally going into a shadow, a shadow, a shadow operation that is informality. You know, so making sure one of the ways is just light, electricity. You know, um, well, uh, incentivizing it's... them to be more formalized We're using our policy and regulation. You know, in doing so, it will be better for everyone. All right, Dr. Vincent Wani, business and investment consultant. Thank you for talking to us today on the program. We will be back in a moment and talk about an equally important matter. Don't go away. What's your experience been living in your part of uh, Nigeria in terms of the services that you get uh, for having to work at home for so long? Well, that and so many other issues we'd like to look at this morning. We have the Dr. Tunde Irukera, who is the Chief Executive of Federal Competition and Consumer Protection Commission, FCCPC. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Thank you very much. Well, Good morning. There's a lot of conversation about that you are very well aware of. We've been told, and we also experience it, that this pandemic presents fresh challenges. What are those fresh challenges for you? Well, um... Uh, I'll break that into two. First is that there's a diminishing of uh, resources, um, especially with uh, human assets, uh, boots on the ground, uh, with uh, new protocols, federal government protocols about who works and where they work. And what we've had to do is to create uh, COVID teams. Now, you would have thought that uh, those restrictions would be countrywide, but in the kind of work we do, it's actually uh, taking things up. So there are more complaints. I'll give you key areas, banking, broadband, uh, people are complaining with a lot of businesses and a lot of activity and education moving online. Um, our traffic has created uh, significant challenges, both for banking transactions and every other thing. And so that has created a lot more complaints. Then of course, uh, banking, like I said, Electricity continues to be a problem. And so the complaints have gone up significantly and we've had to work a little smarter. What is even more the case is that the only one thing that hasn't reduced in this entire period of time is consumption. People have to continue to eat and, and, and um, uh, use services. And so that's uh, become problematic in some sense. Um, for the past two weeks, one of the things we've done is to create a post-COVID task force. We had a COVID response task force, and we now have a post-COVID task force where we're checking uh, key nationwide distributors because obviously they've had a lot of things in their warehouses uh, that have been restrictions in movement and uh, diminished distribution capacity. And so some of those things are now moving out. But what we're seeing is that uh, some of them are acting inappropriately, doing what you call liquidation. And so they're liquidating as much as possible uh, things, especially food items, mm. that are not expired but close to expiration. Mm. The problem with that is that 
if they liquidate that, two uh, small-time retailers, um, those ones end up in the market. They're the ones who have it on the shelf for a longer period of time. And then so you've got expired goods in the market. And it's very problematic in the sense that it's more difficult to interdict at that point when it's already in the market. And secondly, if you do not stop it at source, at distribution level, sometimes you're just making double victims. Some of those retailers are victims too. They've paid for this and now they can't sell it. And so we've done quite some work. I've spent the past week in Lagos literally visiting key distributors and their warehouses. And some of the things we found out are okay, but some are actually considerably um, alarming. Well, it's probably uh, well, your assignment, so to speak, is to consumers, but then maybe there's a way to protect those that you have just said now, the retailers, the sellers themselves. But then you mentioned two critical sectors now, agriculture and um, technology, IT in particular. That's been a huge talking point for so many people. Uh, quality of service may not be your core, but consumer experience is. How have you been able to take that on board? And so, with respect to um, technology, we have a special complaint scene. And what we did with the uh, companies, whether they're phone companies or other broadband service providers or banks, is to say, look, you need to identify a, um, key people who would act very quickly to resolve COVID-related complaints. And so resolving complaints is moving uh, quite quickly, but the volume of the complaints is far in excess of the speed of resolution. And so some of the things that have become very clear, uh, if there's any silver lining at all to this period, is for us to know the real strength of our infrastructure. Just as the government has said with respect to healthcare, we can now see what our broadband infrastructure is and what needs to change. But what I'm most concerned about is that companies, regardless of the difficulties with the broadband infrastructure, is there needs to be a sensitivity and responsiveness to consumers that prioritizes addressing their issues. And one of the biggest things I've seen is when consumers don't get the service or the speed is throttled, there are no refunds. On, on, on whose part here? On, that, on the part of the, the operators or the regulator? Oh, certainly on the part of the operators. It's not the regulators who would uh, develop their uh, um, quality of, of, or standards of service. It is the operators. Yeah, but the, the regulator also has a responsibility here in ensuring that the quality of service is up to par. Otherwise, the, con the consumer experience that complaints that you will get will continue to increase. Oh, absolutely. And I think that that is happening. I think that that is, I certainly think that that is happening. We're regulators, we're in constant communication with other sector regulators in telecommunications, for instance, with the NCC. I mean, I've been in correspondence with the executive vice chairman uh, so many times in, in this period. And I know that uh, some things have been done. As a matter of fact, we're currently planning an online meeting with chief executives of major uh, service, uh, broadband service providers to address some of these issues. So is it going to be a standard procedure or should it be a standard procedure that they refund? Because I know that for telecoms, even for banks, Consumers don't get this refund. Okay, so um, I think the, um, uh, what we are advocating from a consumer side is that people pay for a service not necessarily wanting their money back. Mm -hmm. And so give them that service. When you're unable to give them that service, you must find a way to still provide the service. In the sense that if speed is throttled to a point where people are unable to go online, un un unable to do their work online, there must be a way of allocating that credit back in time. And so if it's a certain amount of uh, time that they should have had that they didn't have, there must be a methodical way. And the technology to capture that is what we must work on and hold you accountable to. For instance, many years ago, set per second billing wasn't possible. Now the technology has made it possible. With the pay TV, at one point, it was very difficult to tell when you've paid or when you haven't paid. We've worked very strongly and uh, forcefully in that area. Now, um, just as quickly as it is for the service provider to turn you off when your subscription expires, they are able to turn you on now. Immediately you've paid and, to make, and we've worked with them to make sure that when there's evidence of payment, if you do not turn people on, you give them that time back. And so while they're working on whatever their quality infrastructure is, we would work on, we would make sure they work on the technology that makes sure there's retribution.
for when things go wrong. I think that, that is already starting. And one other area that you know we, we see regularly happens to be the, uh, the oil and gas oil industry, the, the petrol. Yes. I mean, you see this regularly. When it's time to jack the prices up, it's, it's very fast. Yes. But when it's time to take it to maybe the lowest threshold or in between, they tell you, well, look, we need to exhaust the some stock. How do you intervene in that regard? Okay, good. Now the um, downstream uh, um, petroleum sector is also otherwise regulated statutorily, including even the pricing. But the one thing that we certainly uh, strongly reject is... Um, a, a margin maximization by what we consider unethical. Um, pricing is a very complex thing. And we recognize that sometimes, even when prices are going to increase, you cannot insist that stock be sold at an old price. You have to find a balance for restocking. Uh, but what I think the um, um, petrol, uh, the PMS sellers, where they shot themselves in the Food is exactly what you said. In the past, they've wanted to sell old stock. And now, um, they've, they've changed the prices immediately. And now they say they want to exhaust stock. And so one of the things we're doing is working with DPR and doing spot checks on uh, filling stations that are violating the law. But you must recognize that at a time like this, violations would occur mm -hmm. and capacity to check it would be limited. Yeah. And that is the case all over the world, not but just in Nigeria. How do you balance when they tell you, look, the economy is struggling, companies are shutting down, you need to regulate with a human face and ensure that companies don't close when you put in those sanctions if you are to put your foot down at the end to the law strictly. And, 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 and that's, that's always a balance that a regulator must always uh, um, carry. And just I, I just told you a moment ago, that one of the reasons why we've gone to the source with expired goods is that we notice that we know that in that space is where the least harm to business is done. Distributors and manufacturers have a common understanding. Manufacturers will come back and take expiring things where their shelf life is limited. They'll come back and take it from the distributors and give them replacement. It's the retailer who suffers if you go take things. And so that's why we're modifying the approach and going to the source. And we a lot of the other things also. We look and say, what, and that's, I just give you an, another example, where one of the things we're strongest about right now is price gouging, excessive, unconscionable, and unjust, unreasonable increase in prices. And so we're looking at the methodology for pricing. And so most consumers just think, look, even if prices would increase, why don't you sell your existing stock based on the price? You got it before. Yeah. But we understand that it's not that simple. Stocks flow into each other. Yeah. Secondly, things have to be priced in a way that the seller can replenish inventory. Mm -hmm. So we understand that and we're trying to find that balance. Well, that, that, that's for goods. How about for services where the prices are just increased? For instance, there's this talk about the pay TV platform that's, you know, people are saying, reduce your prices because it's not a good time or something like that. And, and, and so whether goods or services, the real... What goes into pricing, to some extent, is cost. And so services also have increased costs. I mean, operating in a time like this by itself increases cost. And one of the blanket excuses that uh, almost every service or goods provider in Nigeria attributes uh, price fluctuations to is uh, currency uh, 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 forex rates. And so we understand that and we're managing that process as best as we can. What we think, and, and, and the way we look at it is that show us what your business model is, what your desired margin, at what point you've considered that your business is profitable. And so if that was a 20% margin, our concern would be if at a time like this, when there's greater demand for your business because of a shock to the market based on, on a pandemic, you now move that margin from 20% to say 80%, then that obviously is problematic. That's exploitative and it's unscrupulous. Is that the kind of conversation you had with the DSTV, for instance? Oh, yeah. And, and for when, when, when we saw the price increase with DSTV, we wrote them a very long letter. And they responded very quickly, saying that what they have done at this time is a 2.5% increase that captures what the law says, meaning that increased from 5% 
to 7.5%, and that's all they've done. And, you know, I mean, that's a colorable claim, but it's at least a persuasive explanation for what has happened. So our investigation remains open. And it will raise other questions of what the real margin was, what is acceptable, what is not acceptable. And so that conversation is continuing. And for one thing is, quite frankly, we think that the way it was communicated was insufficient. People recognize taxes, and they would hold the government responsible for increasing taxes. They would not hold companies responsible for increasing taxes. Okay. Got it. You know, uh, the other side to that uh, particular uh, discussion around cable TV is pay as you view or pay as you watch, as some people have called it. I know the FCCPC has been quite busy on social media uh, responding to issues around telecoms, but I know that cable TV has also been a major issue. So is there a position, really, of the FCCPC regarding pay as you watch or you're just watching to see how these things unfold and then you come in eventually to you know, make a statement? Okay, good. That's a very good question. So our role is to make sure that consumers get the best possible from a consumer protection standpoint, from a competition standpoint, to so make sure that the playing field is level. And what are, we don't impose business models on operators. They choose what they want to do, and the price is something that is negotiated between consumers and sellers. Now, with respect, but if we see that there's a business model that is more profitable, um, that is more beneficial to consumers. We will certainly advance that. My challenge with what sometimes is a, um, the discussion around pay as you go in uh, um, pay TV is that there is a, a disconnection. And, and, uh, and, and we've been through this. We've conducted some investigations and done some surveys uh, in different parts of the world. The, the pay as you go model in, in telecommunications is not necessarily applicable. And, and so we confuse it sometimes with pay-per-view. Pay-per-view is not that you pay for what you view from the sense point of when you turn your television on. It is primarily that there are certain programs, maybe a boxing match, a soccer match, or some movies that are still in the cinemas, but that some of the pay TV operators have bought that content, and you can literally request, instead of going to a stadium or going to a cinema to watch, you can watch it in your home and pay for that view. That's pay-per-view. But we confuse it with pay as you go. What people are asking for in pay as you go is when you turn on your television and you're watching, you pay. When you turn off your television and you're not watching, you don't pay. It's difficult because what it is is that the content has been created. What you're paying for is access. How you use the access is entirely discretionary and it's up to you. Quite unlike telephone where the clock starts and the airtime goes down. <laughs> You've paid for content. <laughs> well, so many issues to raise, so little time. But then there's this very important one that we need to bring to your table. Um, that is the, the one that uh, you had to take a particular uh, medical service provider to court. Um, and that, that matter went from uh, this uh, cosmetic surgeon to uh, Luth, to an, another general hospital, then to Luth, and then you had to intervene. Tell us how you got involved in that case in the first place and how far so far. Okay, very good. Uh, I, I won't speak about what's going on in court, but I can tell you our regulatory role. And so one of our key roles is to make sure that even professionals live up to the standards created by the professional authority. And at the end of the day, there are all kinds of other things that are really within our role. And so there was, a, there was one complaint, started with a complaint about someone who said there were misleading statements. I was provided certain assurances about what the outcome of this medical procedure would be. That's not what happened. I'm living with injury. The pictures they showed me about how I would turn out are not exactly what the case is. There were informed consents and waivers I was made to sign just before I went into the theater. And a lot of things that were implicated under our law. And so we opened an investigation. And immediately we called for additional information, it was a barrage. So it was clear to us that these operations had to stop until we could clarify. And we needed to know from other regulatory authorities that that business was safe to continue to operate. And so we did what you call an interim seal and uh, opened an investigation. And after we opened the investigation, a lot more complaints came in, a lot more information, some of it very alarming, some of it very damaging, but we didn't make a 
decision one way or the other. However, the target of the complaint, which would be Med Contour Services and its proprietor, Dr. Adil Koju, completely um, neglected the process. They uh, didn't respond. They didn't even as much as acknowledge that there was a regulatory uh, process going on. And uh, because of that, we have to compel them to respect the regulatory process. And so they've been charged to court criminally to compel their compliance with the regulatory process. We haven't made a decision one way or the other about whether they were right or whether they were wrong. Matter of fact, we will not decide whether their uh, conduct is subject to professional discipline or not. That's for the Medical and Dental Council. We're not trying them for murder or anything. That's for the state's attorney general. But as far as consumer protection, did you make forward-looking statements? Did you misrepresent yourself? Is the quality of care this at the right standard? We have a role in that, okay. and that's what we're looking to enforce. Well, as I said, so many issues to raise and so little time, but we we'll yes. probably have to take this on some other time. But we have to thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tude Rukera, who is the Chief Executive Federal Competition and Consumer Protection Commission. Thank you so much for your Thank you and thoughts. good morning. Okay. All right, we're back uh, with your own contribution to the program. Please stay with us. Okay, welcome back. Let's take a look at some of the comments coming through from you, quite a number of them. Oshino or Kingsley, we're starting with yours. And you think the current administration has shown inconsistencies in the Magu saga. And this implies that there are ulterior motives. The 8th Senate denied him confirmations based on recommendations of another agency, the DSS. And now the same report is being relied upon. We'll take a look at uh, Polycarp at Sarpoli. Uh, this is what he says, still on the same issue, <laughs> saying the EFCC Act and its operations should be revisited to excise police officers from being, or excuse, I believe, from, mm -hmm. from being the head or operatives for obvious reasons. The role of the police in the EFCC should only be to provide security for staff and assets and cover for arrests. Well, this is a kind enough use uh, opinion. The planned closure of Third Midland Bridge for maintenance and construction is long overdue. As to the revised budget 2020, I'm afraid our nation is in trouble because we are not just heading for a recession, but a full-blown depression. That's his opinion. Nigerians need to brace up for the worst. Oh, dear. You dodged that. <laughs> oh, yes, I did. <laughs> Mark, where? So, Sa says, uh, Nigeria should immediately open up the economy by implementing strict post-COVID plans. Critical sectors that facilitate foreign exchange inflows are currently closed. As a result, SMEs relying on these sectors are also closed. Oh. And then look at uh, Raji Fortunde, that uh, Babs, he says, Under our laws, no panel, presidential or judicial, has power to detain or compel anyone to appear before it, except though or through a validly obtained court order. I'm sure your guests will not hold some of these views. It's... If it's one of his, <laughs> if it's one of his clients that is at the receiving end of this, how do you know? I, I wonder. <laughs> Ask him. <laughs> well, Roldex has his appeal quickly, saying the FG should please try to reopen tertiary <laughs> institutions for just final year students. Mm -hmm. I'm very certain that social distancing can be achieved with fewer students in schools. Mm. Idris Shehu, the outcome of the presidential panel investigating Mr. Magumi indict or vindicate him, but until then. Let's continue to advocate for the rule of law and transparency since we don't have much information about what is going on and what the panel knows so far. Is that yours? Oh, no, that's Idris Show. I think it's the one you just read, right? Yes. Okay, so don't forget, uh, yeah, you can keep those comments of yours coming through. We will be glad always to see most, if not all of them. So we'll see you next week. I'm Chamberlain. So. I'm Kairi Okikyode. I'm Ayo, Mark Kinde. I'm Mao Pei, Ogun Yusuf.